Hey guys, so this this video probably won't be uploaded for a while. Um, I want to make my 99th and 100th video first, but I'm just so fascinated by these two um, classic philosophical problems that I thought I'd share my thoughts on them. Um, so, example one. Um, this is from um, what is it? This is the following note. Uh, the following is chapter five, pages 99 to 127. Of Ethical Intuitionism by Michael Humer. Um, so, he says, uh, Moral intuitions are not in general caused by antecedent moral beliefs, since moral intuitions uh, often either conflict with our antecedently held moral theories or are simply unexplained by them. Here are two famous hypothetical examples from the ethics literature. Example one, a doctor in a hospital has five patients who need organ transplants. Otherwise, they will die. They all need different organs. He also has one healthy patient in, in for a routine checkup who happens to be compatible with the five. Should the doctor kill the healthy patient and distribute his organs to the other five? Example two. A runaway troll, uh, trolley is heading for a fork in the, ra uh, in the track. If it takes the left fork, it will collide with and kill five people. If it takes the right fork, it, it will col uh, collide with and kill one person. None of the people can be moved out of the way in time. There is a switch that determines which fork the trolley takes. It is presently set to send the trolley to the left. You can flip the switch, sending the trolley to the right instead, should you flip the switch. So, um, my gut reaction, or intuition, as one would say, is that the first is wrong and the second is right. And just in case you don't know what an intuition is, humor des um, describes it as, reasoning sometimes changes how things seem to us, but there is one thing... There's also a way things seem to uh, us prior to reasoning. Otherwise, reasoning could not get started. The way things seem prior to reasoning we may call an initial appearance. An initial intellectual appearance is an intuition. That is, an intuition that P is a state of its seeming to one that P that is not dependent on inference from other beliefs and results from thinking about P as opposed to perceiving, remembering, or introspecting. An, eth an ethical intuition is an intuition whose content is an evaluative proposition. So, for example, enjoyment is better than suffering. If A is better than B and B is better than C, then A is better than C. It is unjust to punish a person for a crime he did not commit. Courage, benevolence, and honesty are virtues. If a person has a right to do something, then no person has a right to forcibly prevent him from doing that thing. So, um, so example one and two. Um, so my gut reaction and I intuition was that one was wrong and two was right. Now... Let's look at these scenarios again. So example one is basically, to sum it up, a doctor can either kill one person by, um, um, by taking away their organs, or he can save, um, or he can, you know, basically passively kill, and this passive and active killing will become important soon, or he will basically allow or passively um, kill the other five by not giving them what they need. Um, so basically, uh, in the trolley scenario, to sum it up, we have a problem where um, basically you either slow, throw the switch uh, and actively pursue avoiding killing the five people to um, prevent killing the one or to kill the one person, or you do the opposite. You passively um, allow the one person t or uh, allow the five people to die and um, passively allow the first person to survive. Um, so this passive and active sense of action, basically a passive action is letting events unfold when you know that you can stop them, or not passive actions, but being passive in your actions, I suppose. Like, I, I suppose a passive action couldn't actually exist because you can't be you could be passively acting. I, I guess it could be on a scale, like one act would be more active than the other, so in comparison it would be passive. So I guess, yes, passive and active actions. Um, though it may seem sort of contradictory if we're going on a scale and talking about relative, uh, re relative positions on said scale, then yes. Uh, I just want to check my camera for a sec. So anyway, um, so the... Um, yeah, so the passive and active basically um, leads to some interesting ideas. You know, you could say, well, it's, it's in the first situation, 
it's it's not moral to kill the person because you're actively killing them. You know, you're 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 you know physically killing them, um, and you're you know it, to be passive about having five people. But on the other hand, having being passive about five people dying or four people dying, you know, whatever, um, doesn't seem right um, either. But our intuition, nonetheless, is um, you know that this is still wrong. That you shouldn't kill one person and harvest their organs, which, by the way, sounds creepy. Anyway, regardless of intuition um, or first thoughts about, how, uh, regardless of ethical intuition, I should say. Um, so, but in the trolley example, it seems like the reverse. It seems like pulling the switch would be more beneficial because, you know, we can save the, um, we can take active steps to save the four people without directly getting our hands involved. And this is an important concept that applies to both scenarios. The idea that we have, we that we can externalize the costs or basically our involvement. Because think of it this way. Our involvement in the doctor scenario, say that you're the doctor. If you physically kill the person and harvest their organs to save five, five or four people or whatever it was, um, let me check. Five. It was five. Um, if you, you know, physically and directly kill the person, that seems intuitively wrong that you would do something like that. But in the trolley example, all you're doing is pushing a switch. You're not killing the person with your own bare hands. You're not, um, you know, you're not uh, doing it with your, you know, with your bare hands. I, I guess this is the only way I can really describe it. You're not doing it physically, directly. You're doing it indirectly, you know? You're minimizing your externalities, your emotional externalities. Uh, and that's what this situation is all about, I think. I think that's how people, f I, I'm s hugely speculating here. And I know these are deep philosophical problems and the trolley situation, there's a different form of it. Like if you push a really fat person off a cliff or something, would you do it to stop the train or something like that? It's basically the same scenario. So it's not really worth uh, mentioning except it's an aside, I think. But, um, well, maybe not because, you know, that would be physical and direct too. And that's why people don't, I think, actually that reinforces my point. I think that's why people don't want to push the person in the way. I don't even think it's necessarily a fat person. I think it's just a person of enough weight and enough whatever to stop the trolley. I mean, the trolley isn't a train, a full-blown train. It's just a trolley. And I think you could stop a trolley maybe with a person, a dead person or something, clog up the wheels or something. I, I know that's kind of gruesome, but anyway. But I think that kind of proves my point that you don't want to... Um, you don't want to directly kill someone. If you can indirectly kill someone to save five, to directly save five people, that seems intuitively better. Um, now, there's no necessarily good reason why this is, but I think looking at direct and indirect action, active and passive action, um, kind of leads us on the right direction. And I think moving in the same right direction recognizes that these two examples are actually too moralistic. Um, I mean, obviously, they're exceptional examples, but um, they are too moralistic in the sense that we're only looking at morals. We're not looking at cost-benefit analysis or what's more efficient, or which basically cost-benefit analysis talks about. So, so things like efficiency, so things like you know rules, deontology, uh, consequentialism, which are all you know moral theories. But I think when I mean this is getting too moralistic, I, I think. I mean, it's getting too deep-seated in our intuitions when we have to kind of rise above that. Now, I actually like moral intuitionism. I'm, I'm getting more into humor, and I think I might buy one of his books. That, that idea just popped into my head, but I think I, I might buy one of his books and read what he has to say. Because um, I'm really interested in moral intuitionism. Um, I'm not, I don't believe in objective ethics, but I don't believe in subjective ethics either. I'm not a relativist. Um, especially not a culture, a cultural relativist or anything. I, I don't really think that and subjectivism really have any, much merit. But I'm not a theist, so I can't play, base my uh, morals on a god per se, unless I take the position of Roderick Long and people like him of a logical theism or 
or whatever it's called. I forget what it's what it's called. Um, but maybe if I remember to, I'll put the link in the description to the article. Um, but even then, I don't think I necessarily agree with them. I, I think it's a lot of semantics, and it's just atheism by another name, perhaps, perhaps. Um, but anyway, it's it's just good to think about these things. I think because we can externalize the direct costs of it, you know, maybe it's it's better in our mind because it's less messy, it's less direct. You know, we're not directly we are directly impacting what happens, but not with our bare hands, not with our human body. It's not making contact with a person. Now you could say, well, he could ki the doctor could kill the uh, patient the uh, for a routine checkup in a non-physical way, but you know, obviously he could, but, or or the doctor could, but it's not obvious how in this scenario. I'm just going with the more obvious, you know, n physical way, you know, so I can actually um, correctly make or I, I can truthfully make this distinction. You know, you could argue the doctor could do it in a non-direct way too, but it's harder to see how he could do that, uh, how the doctor could do that. Um, and it's not, you know, that, that, that isn't quite clear, you know. Maybe that's also a flaw in my thinking, though. So anyway, um, I've been uh, rambling for about 11 minutes, and um, I, it's good to get back into philosophy, because I know I haven't been talking a lot of philosophy lately, but um, I just wanted to talk about the, um, the trolley problem, basically. I, I, yeah, I would say that, yeah, so... Um, so I, I think I'll call this video something like towards solving, resolving the trolley problem. So anyway, you will probably not see this video for a few weeks, uh, not for a few weeks. Yeah, for a few weeks, uh, maybe before Christmas time, you know, maybe this will be my 101st video or something like that. Um, it's December 11th right now. So yeah, maybe if I did this in 14 days, it'd be December, it would be Christmas. So. Hopefully I do it before then. But anyway, hopefully I'll be seeing you. I think I will. Alright. I hope this was informative and you liked it.